Let me take just a moment to welcome each one of you here this morning. I appreciate the presence of every one of you here. We have a number of guests, and we want you to know that we're truly glad that you're here to worship God with us. And also, we want you to know that you're always welcome here. We invite you to come back and worship at every opportunity you have to be with us here at Emporia Avenue. This morning, I want to talk about attitudes that help us grow, and I would like to begin by reading uh, Luke 17 and the first five verses. And he said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks should come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if the millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Earlier this week, or the last part of last week, I'm trying to remember now, I was uh, talking with one of the elders here, and he was speaking of the potential of this congregation. So this congregation had great potential. He spoke of the good things that we had here as a church and what we could accomplish. He said, if we could just even draw together even closer and, and a little more together, I, I believe we could accomplish even more here. And I certainly agree with his assessment. If a church is to accomplish the Lord's work, to grow in size and spirituality, the members must possess and also grow in certain attitudes and in certain qualities. Before I address these attitudes and qualities, however, let me address a common problem that can hold back a congregation or any organization. One of the problems we face in every area of our life is either lack of communication or miscommunication. This is a problem in our marriages. We say things sometimes that uh, our spouses uh, think is something else that we're saying. It's a problem with raising our children. It's a problem when we're on the jobs and giving instructions and receiving instructions. It is a problem everywhere that we are, and so naturally it is also a problem in the church. We often hear things like we want them to be rather than like they are. We might call this creative interpretation. And sometimes we just like to talk and don't like to listen very well. Remember uh, several years ago, I had a problem with a phone company in a different city, and uh, my telephone, we were back on an old party line back then, and my telephone, uh, I could, it would ring, I would answer it, and nobody would talk to me. But what I finally realized, you know, I'd be saying hello, and the person on the other end, which I didn't know at this time, would start talking, and I'd say hello, and they'd start talking, and I'd say hello, and finally somebody comes over to my house and said, what's wrong with your phone? We can hear you. <laughs> I said, but I can't hear you. And so that's kind of the way it is sometimes. We, we talk, but we don't listen to what's coming in, or maybe we just don't hear it. Now, in this case, it was certainly a technical difficulty, and I didn't hear what was coming in at all. But whenever we fail to communicate, or whenever we misinterpret things that are communicated, small problems will grow into larger problems, and big problems then can become what seems to be almost insurmountable unless we approach them with the right attitude. Now, our goal then is open dialogue with the right attitudes that leads to unity. In Ephesians 4, Paul talks about these attitudes and he said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. <clears throat> now, there are numerous attitudes that must prevail uh, for a congregation before it can grow in numbers and prosper in edification. But I want to just talk about two this morning in the time that we have left, and that would be uh, forgiveness 
and brotherly love. These attitudes must come from God as a result of drawing upon God's power and God's guidance through prayer and through the Holy Word. <clears throat> James said in James 1 and verse 5, he said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives men generously and without reproach, and it will be given him, and let him ask in faith without any doubting. Now, he is talking about, James compares this wisdom uh, from God with earthly wisdom a little later on in this chapter, or actually over in chapter 3, uh, and beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> in fact, he talks about earthly wisdom. And he's saying earthly wisdom will bring chaos to any organization whenever you just use this earthly wisdom. In James 3.14, he said, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, uh, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. So he says, whenever you apply earthly wisdom, when you apply actually, and you could say Satan's wisdom here, he calls it demonic and natural and earthly. He says it's going to cause chaos in any organization where you apply that. However, God's wisdom brings peace and righteousness into any organization where it's used. In verse 13, he said, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. And then he talks about this wisdom from God in verse 17. He said, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. <clears throat> so... If earthly wisdom prevails in any congregation, it will stop the work of the church and souls will be lost both inside and outside the church uh, because they'll fail to be brought into the church. Today's lesson is an exercise in preventive maintenance. I'm not talking about these things because we have great lacking in these things so much here. Uh, you don't change the oil in your engine after the engine seizes up. You know, you're not driving down the street and your engine just freezes up. You know, it won't run anymore. You say, whoa, boy, I better go change the oil. I haven't changed it. Now, let's see, maybe 50, 60,000 miles. Well, it's too late then. You have to do it to begin with. You do that to prevent this from happening. So spiritual maintenance is applying heavenly wisdom to our relationships uh, and making them right as we go along on a continual basis. <clears throat> If God's wisdom and attitudes becomes a way of life for us in a congregation, then it prevents fractures in the church. It makes the church attractive to those who look at it from the inside as well as the outside. So forgiveness and brotherly love, even though they're very closely related, I'm going to talk about them separately. I'm going to talk about forgiveness first and then talk about brotherly love. So let's begin by talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness is difficult to understand sometimes and even more difficult to practice. When the Lord told the apostles that they needed to forgive a brother seven times, if that brother returned to them and said, I repent, they said, increase our faith. <laughs> we need more faith in order to accomplish this. We need, I think, to understand what forgiveness is. Now, what does it mean? I think the Hebrew writer explains it fairly well in Hebrews the 8th chapter in verse 11. He quotes Jeremiah's prophecy from the Old Testament concerning the coming church kingdom and explains some things about it. And in Hebrews 8 and verse 11, he's saying, And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. He's talking about the new covenant, the new kingdom. And then he said, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. <clears throat> Forgiveness, then, is then to not remember so as 
to not hold something or use something against another person after you have forgiven them that. And you say, well, I can't forget. How, how can I not remember? No, not remember so as to hold it against that person once you have forgiven them of that situation. However, if a brother or sister, let's say, uh, cheats you, uh, wisdom of information used uh, might be used to keep that from happening again. It's one thing to hold a sin against someone, and it's another thing to use the information for your own good and for the good of the one who did it to you, for example. Let's say you're in a business deal. <clears throat> you form a business deal with a brother, and that brother, you know, we're going along, and all of a sudden he, uh, he just cuts out of the deal and he leaves you holding the bag for about $50,000. And you end up having to pay that. Well, this brother comes back in about a year and he says, uh, boy, have I got a deal. Uh, let's get into business and I think we can make some money this way. And you say, no thanks, been down that road. And you say, wait a minute, you're holding it against him. No, you're simply using the information for your own good so that you will not cause your brother to be tempted to do the very same thing again. And secondly, to also say that it's refusing to put the temptation in your way again so that just maybe the second time you might not be able to forgive that brother if he drops you into another $50,000 hole. So, there's a difference in not using it against somebody and in using the information. <laughs> and so sometimes that, that's people get that mixed up. I'm just trying to explain that. There are four good reasons to forgive others. First of all, Jesus commands it. In Luke 17, 3, he said, Be on your guard if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And uh, secondly, Jesus exemplified it from the cross. When he was hanging on the cross and the people were out there making fun of him and doing various things, he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing in Luke 23, 34. Now he's not asking for universal salvation. He's not asking them to just uh, forgive when they didn't do anything. He is giving his sacrifice for people's sins right there. And he knows that not very far down the road that there's going to be an opportunity for the whole nation of Israel to hear the new covenant and the repentance and the salvation that they can have in the new covenant through the grace of his sacrifice. And in fact, when Peter preaches that on Pentecost Day in Acts 2 and verse 22, he said, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, and you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. And then he goes on and begins to prove this with various verses, and then about verse 36, he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now was the time that the Lord was praying for that would happen to these people, that they would be forgiven. In verse 38, Peter says to them, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, Jesus exemplified this on the cross to the point of his death on that cross for forgiveness. And third, we as Christians have been and will continue to be forgiven. You see, sometimes people worry about this. We don't just fall in and out of God's grace, you know, every time we make a little bobble in our lives. In fact, in 1 John chapter 6 and verse uh, 
first chapter 1 and verse 6, rather. He's saying, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. What he's saying there, and we talked about this last Sunday evening, this very verse, and saying this is in the present tense and this is a continuous action, and as long as we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus continues to cleanse us from every sin. And then he says, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we have them, but it's forgiven as long as we're walking in the light when we make mistakes and when due sin does come into our life. And he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we are continually forgiven when we're walking in the light of God's word and God's truth. And fourthly, we must forgive in order to be forgiven. In Ephesians 2, uh, 4, 32, it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. And then in Matthew 6, 14, a verse you know even better than that, it says, But if you forgive men for their tra uh, transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. So we have to, in order in order to be saved, in order to have our sins forgiven. Now, as we go back to our scripture reading, uh, the matter of how often the difficulty involved is addressed in certain scriptures, and this is one of them, in Luke 17, 3. He said, Be on your guard if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. And this is when the Lord said, increase our faith. Now, in Matthew 18, he says it a little differently, but basically the same thing. Uh, so Peter comes to him in Matthew 18 and verse 21. And uh, he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And he said, up to seven times. Peter thinks, man, I've got a handle on this. Uh, and Jesus said, I say not unto you seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, Peter could add, he knew that was uh, uh, 490 times. And if you're keeping a book on somebody uh, and you're up to about uh, 400, then you better be a good record keeper. But I don't think you'll do that. Because I'll tell you what, this is what Jesus was saying. He said, if you even start keeping a book and you keep forgiving people, it, comes, it becomes a part of your nature. And you won't have to. You'll throw your book away pretty soon. You won't need to keep a record. We simply forgive and move on. The work of the Lord and his church and teaching the gospel and saving the lost is far more important than this. And then we should never let this hinder us and let us get bogged down in petty grievances, holy grudges, or any of those things. And besides that, it will cause us to be lost. So you see... As long as we just move along like we're supposed to, forgive people like we're supposed to, and do the work of the Lord, then everything works for our good and for the good of the church. But then there's brotherly love to add to this. Brotherly love is vital to Christianity. Uh, the Christian who lacks, uh, lacks this, has a spiritual disease and heart failure, can be a major cause of death in the church, you know, a heart failure. Failure is a major cause of death in our society. But spiritual heart failure is a major cause of death in the church. A person may be counted as a member of the Lord's body. He may sing and pray and play and pray. But if he hates his brother, he's going to be lost. In 1 John 2 and verse 9 through 11, he said, No... The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. And the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling for him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And then if you go over to chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15, he said, We know we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
So if that becomes a problem in your life as a Christian, you can't be reconciled to the Father without being reconciled to the whole family. In John chapter 4 and verse 20 and 21, he says, if somebody says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So he ties these two together. Brotherly love could well be illustrated as a badge of Christianity. It helps both in and out of the church to recognize us as Jesus' disciples. You recognize a law enforcement officer by their badge. They may wear on their uniform or that big badge that's a sign on their car. You know, it's, it's the same thing. It's just a big badge uh, on their car. And so if you're driving along and you come over a hill and there's that big badge on a car down there, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> you check your speedometer, don't you? To say, am I driving too slow here? You know, there is a minimum speed limit. And I'm sure you check your speedometer and say, am I driving too slow and I might get picked up because I'm just creeping along here? Now, I know you wouldn't be driving too fast, so it must be that. But anyway, you check your speedometer. I remember uh, not checking my speedometer one time. It was, we were on a trip uh, a few years ago, and we were driving down Highway 1 along the coast of California, and it's that crooked little road that had a 55 mile per hour limit, and you could not possibly hardly go 55 miles per hour, uh, about 35 to 45, and all of a sudden then, it curves away from the ocean and goes down over this beautiful valley, long, straight, down this steep hill. And uh, I'm just driving out, and all of a sudden, here I can see everything. I'm, I'm having to watch the road every minute. So I'm just looking at the scenery, and I'm just letting this old Buick coast. And all of a sudden, then I look down at the speed limit, and it's going way over 455. And so I start putting on my brake, and then I look up, and here's this badge huge badge right there on the side of the car. Let's just say that the trip got a little more expensive about that time. <laughs> but I was not paying attention. But I, what I'm trying to say is that the badge catches your attention. And this is what love does when it's displayed in our lives. Visitors who come window shopping will notice whether we love one another or not. In John 13, 34, it says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Now, this is strong love that Jesus is putting out here. He said, That you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's the way they see us. And love is what produces fruit in the life of a Christian. As we go back to 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, it says, Whoever has this world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. So love, he's saying, brings forth, real love brings forth the fruit in our Christianity. <clears throat> love guides us in our relationships and our responses to our brothers and sisters in Christ. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 8 here, <clears throat> he's been talking about uh, relationships, servants, he's been talking about wives, he's been talking to husbands, and then in verse 8 of chapter 3, he talks about all. He said, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead that you, may be, uh, that you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And so he's saying, if somebody insults you, you don't return that. You return a blessing to that individual. And that's what love does in response to brothers and sisters. One result of love is summed up by the psalmist in chapter 1, verse 33. 
which says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. And it is. Paul, if Paul were alive and Paul wrote a letter to us, I would wish that Paul would write to us the same thing that he wrote to the Thessalonians. And I certainly hope that we live in a way where he could do this. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and uh, verse 9, he said, Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Isn't that what we've been talking about here? God teaches us to love one another. He said, For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But I urge you, brethren, to excel even more. And he says, Okay, you're doing good. You're doing good. But I want you to do even better. He said, And make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Attend to your own business. Work with your hands just as we are commanded to that you may behave properly toward outsiders who may be in any need. So he says, not only inside the church, but toward outsiders that you behave properly in that way. Wouldn't it be great if, if, if God would write that to us? And I, I hope he would, if he should write us a letter today. But as we continue and improve in forgiveness and brotherly love, it will take us a long way in accomplishing God's will. You see, it brings forth fruit, as we talked about here at Emporia Avenue. So these attitudes must prevail for a church to move forward in spiritual and numerical growth. These are just necessities. And so I'm just reminding you today that these things will draw us even closer together than we already are. On the other hand, it will hinder a church in those areas where the members fail to practice forgiveness and brotherly love. Now, it's unfortunate I have observed and experienced firsthand and have seen the damage it can cause whenever brothers and sisters fail to practice that. Not here, but in other places. I've seen the damage it can do. And it can cause souls to be lost in eternity, and that's the greatest damage you could ever do in any circumstances. So love of God is tied to keeping the commandments of God. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, he said, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I like the last part of that verse. His commandments are not burdensome. All God's commandments are for our benefit. That's what they were written for, to benefit us so that we could have salvation, so that we could have uh, brotherly love, so that we could have forgiveness for each other, so that we could have eternal life. They are not burdensome, and yet I have talked to people through the years who thought that Christianity was just a bigger burden than they wanted to bear. It will restrict me. It will keep me from doing the things I want to do. And usually it was people who were in love with sin or a certain sin that would say these things. But let me tell you, the burden of carrying around sin is a lot harder than carrying Christianity on your shoulders, the cloak of Christianity. It is, I've been on both sides of that fence. I know that it's a lot harder to carry the load of sin. And eventually, if you carry it all your life, it will eventually just pull you down and destroy you and ruin you in one way or another before you end your life. And so you need to put it off and put on Christ. And if you've not done what God commanded for salvation, we talked about it just a few minutes ago in this lesson. Now that people were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins whenever they repented, whenever they believed, and whenever they needed that salvation. And if you haven't done that, we can help you with it this morning. And if you've turned aside because you're lacking in these two attitudes we've talked about or any other of the things that God tells you to do, then let me encourage you to repent, to turn away from those things, turn back to God. And if there's any way that we can help you, we will certainly do our part. While we stand and sing the invitation song, if you'll let us go.